thanks for that. That's uh, kind of a lot to live up to, isn't it? So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you guys today a little bit about is some of the lessons I learned while I was at Birchbox. Um, and for, for context, because Birchbox was never in Australia, I'll just explain what it is quickly. Um, so Birchbox was founded on this notion that in a lot of categories, retail had moved online. People were purchasing a lot via e-commerce and so forth. But in beauty, it was really lagging. Um, and that had to do with sort of the tactile nature of beauty. Beauty is something that you want to smell, you want to touch it, you want to put it on your skin and see if you get a rash. It's, it's that kind of thing. Um, and so Birchbox came up with this concept of a subscription. So we offered a box that you signed up to, you paid $10 a month, and it was tailored to you, and you got these samples every, every month. Um, we had content that you could learn from so that you could figure out, well, how do I contour my face? Like, who even knows how to do that? Um, and then if you wanted to add these things to your routine, you could purchase them from us in one of our stores or online. And so Birchbox, it, it grew really quickly. It was uh, quite amazing how much this concept resonated with, with, with women. Um, I started at Birchbox when there were about 10 people in the business, and we had a few thousand subscribers. Um, a few short years later, we had more than a million subscribers. We were operating in six countries out of four offices. Um, there were probably about 350 employees in the business. And my own team had grown from sort of zero and me to about 60 people within that sort of product, product design, engineering, data science organization. Um, so I learned a lot on that journey. And I had a hard time figuring out what I should talk to you about, but I ended up coming up with some things that two things that fall into sort of like a product development bucket and two things that fall into a team bucket. So starting off with personalization. So um, that PhD that was mentioned, that's actually in AI. So I've long sort of understood the power of like artificial intelligence. But at Birchbox, I really learned the impact that it can have on a business. Um, and it did have a profound impact on, on our business at Birchbox. So I like to think of personalization as dividing into two different types. So explicit personalization and the sort of personalization that does, just disappears, that you don't know about, but it improves the usability of the, your experience. Um, so when it comes to explicit personalization, think about you know, that sort of module that's recommending you products on Amazon.com, or your Gmail inbox that's sorted for you in a personalized way about what's important and what's not. Um, and at Birchbox, we had a very core part of our experience was something that was explicitly personalized. And that was the box experience. So essentially, every month, we needed to work out what samples should we give to what customers. Um, and we modeled this as a constraint problem. So we collected hard, hard constraints, which were things like, we wouldn't send you the same sample that you'd ever received before. That was an example of a hard constraint. Um, something to do with skin tone, maybe. Someone with light skin shouldn't have a product that's designed for someone with dark skin. Um, and really just also the number of samples that we had. At any point in time, we only had you know, quantity X of each different sample. And then we also looked at soft constraints. So things like based on your demographic, we think you will like X. Our merchant team thinks that. Um, or based on what we've learned about you and modeled from the products you viewed, how you rated them, how you purchased, we think you'll like these products more than these other ones. And so we combined all this sort of information into what was you know, a large constraint satisfaction problem, essentially. And we used mixed integer programming to figure out what boxes should we build and who should get what box. Um, and this, this took a lot of effort in the end, because as the business grew, you're dealing with like an, an, an NP hard problem at the end of the day. Um, so we spent a lot of time modeling that mixed integer program to work out how to make it solve not in the age of the universe, put it that way. Um, and look, one of the rules that I sort of have in mind when I think of explicitly personalized experiences is that you have to be careful about making mistakes. When you make a mistake, a customer can notice it. They're like, oh, why did you recommend me that? I hate that. Um, and it's even worse in a case like this where you're not just recommending something to someone, you sent it to them and they paid for it. Um, and so it's really important to figure out how you can ameliorate those sort of issues. Um, and one of the ways we did that was with the beauty profile. So customers told us a lot about themselves, and they could adjust that to tailor their box. Um, but we were always looking for a way to improve this. And, and we realized that, well, maybe we can get the customer even more involved, and maybe that will help. And so what we did was we introduced this thing called, we called sample choice. And so we gave customers the opportunity to choose one of their samples, so just one. 
Um, and it was amazing the impact this had. The engagement was incredibly high. That was a problem from a technical perspective, actually, because everybody rushed to choose their sample at the same time. Um, and in addition to that, people purchased more full-size products from us, and they had a better attitude towards their box. They were happier with it. Um, and so it was a really interesting learning for me just around the value of getting the customer involved or the user involved when you're explicitly personalizing something. So we also spent a lot of time working on this type of personalization that, that just disappears. And what I really learned here was just the amount of sort of incremental revenue you can make from doing these things. So we often found that we would have a 5% increase in conversion here, 10% there, another 20% over here sometimes. And that translated into many millions of dollars in additional revenue. Um, and so one of the things we focused on was having the right message. So how can I tell you about the things that you are interested and in and not the ones that you're not? Um, and really, some of that was based on quite complex algorithms, and some of it was based on really simple things. For example, just being attentive to what the customer is doing. Suppose they were recently browsing in you know, the, the category hair. We would show them a product that was suitable for them in that category, in, in their sort of discovery feed. These little pieces of attentiveness. We did other things that were attentive to the customer's state. So were they a new customer? Did they subscribe to the women's box or the men's or both and so forth? Um, and all the sort of marketing messages that you saw, the promotions and so forth, were tailored to that state that you were in. And none of that involves fancy AI, um, but it was incredibly effective. The other thing we looked at was the right time. And really the insight here is that there's a, there's a power to doing things on the customer's schedule, not on the marketer's schedule. Um, so even when we had very sophisticated, personalized blast programs, they never worked as well as when we literally timed our communication to what was happening with the customer in that moment. Um, so an example, some of the things we did were based on statistical models. So for instance, we modeled if you were likely to make a purchase soon, or if you were thinking of canceling your subscription. Um, and we also just looked at what state you were in in terms of your engagement with us. And we based um, much of what we, we did on those sorts of things, and the conversion was, was really impressive. Um, and then just sort of when you're going about trying to always have the right message at the right time, you end up by thinking about how all the different places you touch your customer. And what I found that from a technical perspective was really important was being able to have sort of a single view of that customer, so it could be used in all the different places. Um, and that can take quite a lot of effort, um, but for us it, it really paid off. But then my, my piece of advice here is that if you're just starting out with like using AI in your business, which um, some of you probably are and some of you might have really sophisticated practices, but if you're just starting out, start simple. It's a, you, know, you can do something simple, you can measure it and see the impact, figure out if it's worth investing there more, um, but it's actually quite interesting what you can achieve with relatively simple things. So the other topic I want to talk a little bit about is managing technical debt, and this is something we all deal with, um, and a very familiar topic, particularly in startups. Um, and so to give you the little background on Birchbox is, when I joined Birchbox, the code had been produced by an agency, which I figured out through the code base had actually been subcontracted sneakily to another agency. Um, there was no code inversion control, and the whole thing was just like falling over on the weight of these subscribers. Um, and so it was really difficult to do a lot about it at that point because there was just me and a massively growing subscriber base. Um, and, but we did sort of get larger, the team grew. Um, we had more headspace. But by the time we got a little bit more headspace, what happened is we made an acquisition. So we acquired a company in Europe. Um, and that company was itself the product of a couple of previous acquisitions. And so one day we turned around and we were this small team and we went from having one fairly terrible code base to having four fairly terrible code bases. <laughs> I was just like, wow, you know, can't, can't, can't catch a break. Um, but it taught me the importance of getting really scrappy. Um, and because of the, so this is what's going to really date me right now, but we were on hardware. Um, and that had something to do with the um, particular e-commerce system that was involved in all of this. And one of the things we did that bought us a bunch of time is we just paid for what were then quite expensive Fusion IO SD cards to help the database run faster. And that actually had a really big impact um, and it, it helped a lot. And then we took this sort of, we did toy with the idea of like just rip it all up and, um, 
and, and build it new, but it wasn't a good strategy. It would have taken a very long time, maybe not the age of the universe, but a fair amount of time. Um, and so we sort of embarked on this project of steady progress. And we did what everyone with monolithic applications does, is we separated the front and the back end, we wrapped the back end in services, we built services beside those services, we fixed the old ones, um, and we slowly got rid of our technical debt. But in doing this, we developed a really sort of good methodology for going about it. It was sort of repeatable and understandable, and we built a lot of confidence within in the business. Um, this did require like a lot of patience, um, and I think this is hard for an en engineering team. Um, but it, it did pay off in the end, and I've, I've often talked to people that have tried the sort of like the, the big switch. Um, and often the problem that you find, of course, is that what's meant to take three months takes six, what takes meant to take six takes 12, and then you needed something different anyway. Um, and so we really found this like slow and steady approach did, did wonders for us in the end. Um, but we did have to do a few sort of fairly large cutovers. But by the time we did them, we had built up a lot of expertise in doing that. Um, the largest one we did was actually, we, we sort of tried to get rid of some of those stacks. So we went from four down to two. Um, and we took the US stack, we internationalized it, we m did a whole bunch of the localizations from a couple of the countries, and then we moved them over. And that was a really big endeavor because we were essentially changing everything that people did in their day to day in these two different offices. Um, so it's not the kind of thing that you can sort of loosey goosey. Um, it needed, basically we had to project manage the shit out of it. Um, and that made a huge difference. Project management is not sexy and honestly, I don't personally find it fun. Um, it doesn't feel very agile, but sometimes you just really need to do it. And so if you can find um, an engineering lead or a product lead for a project like this that is really good at project management, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. So moving on to some of the team stuff. Um, something that happens when you're in a fast growing business is, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, is you're under a lot of pressure to hire. So your CEO is probably asking you all the time, like, how's that um, hiring funnel going? Like, how, how many people have you hired this week or this month? Um, and it's a tricky thing to do, to hire well and to hire fast at the same time. Um, and something that I learned early on is that the hiring filters you have can actually have some sort of like unexpected implications. Um, and so one of the things that I, I looked for initially when I was hiring engineers in particular um, was open source experience. I was sort of felt that that would be a really great way to get people that loved what they did. Um, and the thing that I hadn't realized and I sort of came to understand relatively quickly was that because it, particularly at the time, women were not very well represented in the open source community, it actually meant that we were having more trouble hiring women. Um, so it just gives you a notion of like there's, you need to be careful with your hiring filters. And what I found is that having them as small as possible um, is actually in some ways the most predictable way to go. So I often think about this as like, you wanna compromise, um, but not on the things that, that really count. So some of the things that I've successfully managed to compromise on was location of people. Um, so we hired people remotely before we really felt ready for it. It actually worked out really well. We hired people who were more junior than we necessarily wanted, or folks that had like zero experience in our tech stack. Um, but the things we never compromised on were the quality of the designer, the product manager, the engineer, um, and on their fit with the team. Um, and I think like many of you, we had a very strict, um, no brilliant jerk or no asshole policy, and that served us well, and that does serve you well in, in startups in general, I think. And then essentially what that's all about is playing the long game. Your CEO might be pressuring you for today, but you've got this team for the long term, so you need to think about that. Um, and then this one is always like with hiring, it's, it's bit me multiple times is, like I've got my hiring funnel to a great point, everything's going good, then I'm like, okay, that's great. And I turn my head over here because something else is burning and the nature of funnels is that you don't feel your lack of attention for a little bit, but then you do feel it later and it takes a long time to wind it back up again. And so my, my learning here is really, if you're in a fast growing business, never take your foot off the hiring accelerator, just, just keep going, keep paying it attention. So then quickly on building and maintaining culture, the, I think the, the most important thing I found was figuring out what the right like, product development culture was for the business that we were in. Um, so Birchbox had 
to be honest, fantastic margins for a retail business, but it still had retail margins. These are not Google ad revenue margins. You can't um, build a team that simply wants to build products or technology for the sake of the products or technology. Um, and so what I looked to do was try and build a culture where we had folks that really valued the work that they did and took pride and joy in their work and wanted to learn um, and, and were passionate about it, but also folks that were very passionate about the outcome for the customer and the outcome for the business. And sort of by holding those two things in tension, what we found was that we were able to have like engineers and product managers and so forth who, if the right solution for the business was a quick hack, they were happy to do that and they did it well and they could make that decision themselves. Um, and when the right decision was to invest in something deeply and go through all the complexity, they had the skills and the desire and the willingness to do that too. Um, the other thing that, of course, I mentioned before was like, you want people that are good at teamwork. So that was like an, another very key point here. Um, but there's all these things that shape culture, and I think once you've figured out what the culture is that you want, you then sort of have to be a little bit careful to go through all the things that might be influencing it. And I listed a few of them here, but obviously it's about how you hire. It's also even just about your processes, the ones that you have, the ones that you don't have, um, how your team makes decisions, how the team talks to each other, how you manage. There's many things that go into this. And there's often some controversy when people talk about culture in terms of like traditions and artifacts and in-jokes and these sorts of things. Um, because when businesses scale quickly, it's hard to bring people on board with that. Um, but interestingly, what I've found is that, and this was a big lesson for me, that if you manage it in the right way, cultural artifacts, traditions, the little funny things your team does, like even the in-jokes, they can sort of act as a glue they like help you know, the folks who are dealing with all the change, they help link them to the past, um, and they help new folks sort of understand where the history of things and where they came from, and they actually bring people together. So done in the right way, I think these things can actually work really well and be a lot of fun at the same time, which is, and that's one of the reasons why we work in startups, is for fun. Um, oh. I meant to hide that, but that was some of our cultural artifacts and traditions. We did a lot of dress up um, at Birchbox. Um, that was, I don't even know what that was. That might have been St. Paddy's Day. Um, that's a representation that was on the, one of our walls about the Birch bot, which lived in IRC. We used IRC, this is pre-Slack. Um, so lo just lots of fun things. Um, and then the, the final thing I really learned about culture is just how amazingly resilient it is. If you've built a good culture, and I think if you've probably built a bad one too, um, the ups and the downs, the like people leaving the job, you, you leaving the company, and like I, I left Birchbox eventually, um, the culture can be really resilient to that. And so it's sort of like this gift or poison gift that you, you live behind, leave behind you. Um, so that was a really big learning for me. And that's it, thank you.